Good afternoon, everyone. Coach Rob here, Sure Thing Studios. I'm here with this very special guest, a very good friend of mine, uh, New Jersey City University head coach, Harry Turner. Harry, how are you today? Not bad, man. Surviving quarantine. How about you? That's right. Everything is good. I'm here at home uh, where it is safe and where there's no, uh, where there's no COVID germs. So we're going to do it this way through Zoom, even though we're about 10 minutes away from each other. Safety first. Yep. So, Harry, before we uh, really dive in with the NJCU stuff, I want the audience to get to know you better because I think it'll help orient everybody as to the kind of person, the kind of coach you are. And I think when people – hopefully this helps you, you know, maybe market your new program a little bit. Um, I think it's good for everybody to know, uh, you know, where you're from. So, and, you know, your personal wrestling resume is kind of strange, right, because you were what, you were what they would call a late bloomer, right? That's one thing, one way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you know, you look at the, the, the website and you can run the stats and you can say it's, pr it's pretty lean up until senior year when you made a, a, a pretty important decision for yourself. Right. I mean, it's non-existent up until my senior year. I didn't even make States until my final year. Why don't you tell everybody about that? My senior year? Yeah. Well, kind of the, the process. Yeah. Yeah, so junior year, I uh, finally came into my own a little bit. Even going back further than that, I think I had 18 total wins as a freshman and sophomore. Like you said, somebody can run the stats back on that. But it was rough times in the Turner household. And then uh, junior year, got up above that 20-win mark, was doing pretty well for myself at 215. Uh, lost in the region, Conti Semis, to another short thing guy, actually, Rod Phillips, another practice partner, Brick Memorial. Give them a quick shout out. But that ended my junior year, so I didn't even make it to the States. And then senior year, I was 215, went nuts for most of the year, and then bumped up to heavyweight just for districts. We were much stronger as a team with me at 215, but heavyweight was ripe for the picking. So I bumped up, rough process to win a spot in the Howell wrestling room. As I'm sure you know, for the people who don't, I had to win a wrestle off against the guy I'd known since I was eight years old. And lost some friends along the way. Hey, it was rough. Well, you know, there's a real lesson I think that people can learn from a guy like Harry Turner, who I, I remember you from, as predator guy. And there was, again, there was some more lean years in the Turner household, right? There were lean years all the way up until the 18th birthday. Well, how, so how did you, this is going to help people get to know you. How did you deal with that? Because it was hard. It was really hard. And I, re I recall years where there were zero wins for a long time. And here you are now. You, have, you were a Division I wrestler. You were a state finalist. You, uh, you coached at the, the biggest program in the state, Rutgers. Uh, you've been a Big Ten wrestling coach. And now you've got your very own program. How, how did you – how were you able to work through – so many years of of down to get to the up luckily I had a lot of people around me you know you came from the same system we had Vinny always there in my corner my pops all those people down at Predator gags going all of them just told me my time would come and it was, I was dumb enough to believe them and if you're dumb enough to believe in yourself then good things can happen I wrestled 100 matches every off season. Uh, that certainly helped people just to get mad time, your body's going to catch up. And it did. When it finally did, I went off, which, you know, that's what a lot of kids face. You know, I tell all the upperweights that that are 14 and 15 years old, being a 14 and 15 year old upperweight, you're going to take a lot of lumps. But if you stick with it and you put the time in, all of a sudden one day you go from this tall to this tall and you get a little, as long as you have the wrestling talent to back it up, if you've been working on it, then you're going to get the results down the road. And it's probably different for upperweights, right? Because you're, you're dealing with, you might, you might be a certain, certain weight person, but if you aren't, a, if you aren't, if your hormones and your maturity levels haven't caught up, uh, I would describe it differently if we weren't on camera, um, then there's not a whole lot you can do about those power differences, right? No, if you're a five foot four, 195 pounder, you're going to get your head banged on a lot and you got to find ways to compensate for that. And I had a lot of ways to compensate. And then when my body caught up, I was able to use that stuff, all that stuff that you know in your brain, once your body's finally able to do it because you've been practicing moves so often, then that's when the good things start to happen. So, so let's fast forward to senior year. Now you basically ripped through the entire bracket straight through to the, 
uh, state finals. You, you won the district, you won the region. And then you ran into, in the state final, Jimmy Lawson, who's a, another very familiar name to everybody in the wrestling world, who you, ha- you had beaten in January at the All-Star match, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we both knew it was going to come down to me and him. We got made fun of the week prior in the region practice. He lost in the region semi, so he had a real weird seed. Both of us did because I had no criteria at heavyweight. I bumped up just for districts. So I was like, I hit the eight seed in the quarter, or the one seed in the quarter. He was down with like, he was like 16th or something back then they were like 24, but we were in the region practices together. And he actually said to his coaches like, Hey, should we be going live together? Like, what if we hit each other in the state final? We're talking about, he was a sophomore at the time. I was a kid who'd never gone to States. So our coaches straight up laughed in our faces. They were like, what the state final? What the hell are you two talking about? Like get in there, go, go with each other. And then I won in the semi walked off the mat. I think I was talking to batters and I heard the crowd behind me and I turned, it was Jimmy getting his hand raised. We knew from, the moment regions were over, we were going to hit. So that was an awesome match. I mean, like I said, we knew it was coming down to us. We had known each other for a while at that point. We knew every trick each other had. Great match. And then we had a bunch more, probably better goes in the short thing room after that when we got to college. So Right. And, then, a- and, and let's not sleep on the kind of student that you work. Harry, you have a degree from Lock Haven, right? Yes, I do. And you put and you put a nice hard nosed career into uh, into wrestling at the Haven, right? You wrestled there for five years. Yep, wrestled there for five. Coached for two. Was in there for a long time. Was division was Division One wrestling everything you thought it would be? Uh, division One wrestling wakes you up right away. I had no idea what it was going to be until I got there. You think that you're pretty good, like I like you said, I had a pretty good senior year. And you think you're going to continue to have that success. And I got to a division one room and in mid October, I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. I hadn't scored a point on anybody for like two months. It's division one wrestling is everything that I thought it was and a whole lot more. And regarding being an upper way, what, what's the difference between wrestling an 18 year old and wrestling a 24 year old, 250 pounder? All of a sudden, everything that used to work on the 18-year-old, you go to hit, and it's like doing it against a refrigerator. You you go to elbow pass, and the guy's still standing right in front of you, just clubbing you in the face. But again, it was another... uh, Yeah, that first pass was boring. Just another example of you kind of sticking through it, right? You started for several years. Yeah, yeah. Well, my first year as a redshirt freshman, and then again, next year, I was a starter all the way through, but... We got a new coach my sophomore year. He saw me go through that sophomore year when I went like 12 and 21 or something at 197. And he was like, I got to get this kid out of here. And he started bringing in people to replace me every semester. Somebody transferred in at 197. And it was just one of those things where it was like, you know, screw these kids. This is my wrestling room. So I was unbeatable in the room. He couldn't get me out of there. And then eventually, same thing. I was too slow to be a good 97. I was tired of getting my low singles blocked and just spun around like an idiot. So I went up to heavyweight where everything that made me a bad 197 made me a pretty good heavyweight. And I had a little bit more success with the big boys. <laughs> and they liked you, and they liked you enough to bring to bring you back as a coach after you graduated, right? Yeah, yeah. Again, sticking with it and changing some habits can really make a difference. Well, Same you know, as they did in high school. Wrestling media like uh, you know, the big websites like to make it seem really attractive to be a collegiate coach and be a, be a big time D one guy, be a a resident athlete or a volunteer assistant. Um, It was, I understand that it was a long time before you were actually making a living doing this, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When you start out, it's more like being a groupie for a band than actually earning a living. And like, you just follow them around and give pointers and help out where you can. And for the first couple of years I was doing it, it was for dirt. Like at one point I was making 500 bucks a month at Lock Haven. When I left that job, I actually took a pay cut to $0. I survived off the money I made over the summer delivering bags of uh, water softener salt. Not a fun living, but that's how I got through that winter. And you get enough experience under your belt and you sell yourself like you've been, been there and done that. And then you get the actual jobs. I mean, just another example of, you know, your ability to stick, to it when a lot of people would have given up you you left lock haven and you so you had it so ingrained in your mind that you were going to be a college wrestling coach that you took you downgraded yourself to a volunteer assistant in order to get up to buffalo right yeah yeah um when i did my first semester at lock haven i was still finishing up school i had switched majors i had set myself back 
But uh, so I was still going to school to be a teacher. And after that first semester, I coached, I fell in love with it. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to do anything else in my life. I never looked back, never even got my substitute license, any of that. Didn't take any of the normal steps you would as a fallback plan to be a teacher. I just kind of jumped in. And Buffalo, yeah, Coach Stutzman was the one who gave me a shot. I was a no-name kid, hadn't even made it to NCAAs, had a decent career, just under 100 wins. He saw that. Luckily, he was a coach at Bloom when I was at Lock Haven, so he knew me personally. And he reached out and he was like, I need somebody who can not ask questions and come up here and just grind their nose every day. And I was like, I'm done. I threw a sleeping bag in the back of the Jeep Cherokee and drove up to Buffalo. And that's why I am where I am now. If I I hadn't done that, it's over. I think I specifically remember talking to you right before you took the Buffalo job and he told you that you needed to get up there and be in wrestling shape. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> and I wasn't. <laughs> I got up there and he had three really good heavyweights. One of them, Jake Gunning, Mac Champ. Uh, you know, he was always ranked right around the top 25. And the second assistant was the Bloom heavyweight when I was in Lockhaven. Justin Grant, I think he AA, he was always a top 25 kid, ended up making the Olympic trials a couple of years. So I went up there and I got my teeth kicked in again like all over again, like I was a freshman and it was, all right, get in shape. You got to be some use to me. So I did, you know, I I knew I didn't want to teach. I knew I liked what I was doing with him. So that was my shot. Okay. So, uh, Harry, the the next stage in your journey was, was back home here at Rutgers, right? Yep. And what was, what was coming home? Like coming home was the best. I had come home. It was around May when I left Buffalo and I drove back down and I remember, I still remember to this day, I was on the beach for the first time in God knows how long, but I was there and Goody texted me. He was like, Hey, heard you're hanging out around home. You want to come to a workout tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I came up, we went to the college F gym. I was banging around with Ray, Raison Gross. Uh, Matt Carenti was there at the time. They had a bunch of good upper weights, but we did that for like three weeks. It was the whole time I was home. And finally Goody was like, you want to stick around this year and keep doing this? I was like, yeah, more than anything. I do not want to go back up to Buffalo. You know, I'm a Jersey guy. I want to be here. This is where everything's happening. So I had a little like three week trial period. And then at the end of it, that was the whole job offer. Hey, you want to keep doing what you're doing for the whole year? Yeah. hundred percent in. And, and that's what they call That's they call that resident athlete, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, so uh, it's not so much of an Instagram post. It's a, it's a, it's a way different experience, right? Yeah. It's uh. We called it that I wasn't an athlete anymore by any means. I was a coach and I had been a coach for a long time to be a resident athlete. You technically have to have some kind of accomplishment in the last like five calendar years. By the time I got to Rutgers, I had been coaching for five years. So I was like the SKWC resident athlete coach. I was a player coach, like Casey Stengel. It was nuts, but (laughs) You know, we, it was just a title. Really, I was just a workout partner. And, you know, that's what my value was. We needed bodies to throw at the big guys. You know, Leo is just one man. He can't cover all of them. So that was my value for that first year. And uh, the one thing I learned at Lock Haven and Buffalo, they don't give you a spot on the staff. You got to kind of reach out and take it. So I just started, besides working out, I would just go and sit in the office every day. And I would just annoy the hell out of Pollard and Leo. I would just sit there and be like, hey, give me something to do. Give me something to do. And eventually they started giving me stuff to do, the stuff that I learned how to do with Buffalo. And I did it well enough that the next year I was actually on staff. So again, just, just be annoying, stick with it, and good things come your way, you know? Be a- What's Goody like? He's a blast to work with. I mean, every day was an adventure. <laughs> you hate him, you love him, all in the span of 12 hours. But we always had a blast up there, all those guys. They were a blast to work with. Donnie, Leo, Pollard. I jumped in with a group that had been together for – years and years and years so seeing them operate and seeing the things that they were able to build together over that time period before I got there that's what gave me a lot of the lessons I just stole all the fruits of their labor the things that they figured out together through the hard times I took all that good stuff and went to Jersey City where I'm trying to apply all the good stuff to my own program now and yeah so Harry you're at uh, New Jersey City University now which is um uh a bra- literally a brand new wrestling team. Tell us how, how did that happen? <laughs> Luckily, so again, it's good to just be in Jersey. This is the kind of thing I mean when I talk about the community support and people knowing people, the stuff you're missing at Buffalo and Lock Haven. Uh, the AD at NJCU was a former associate athletic director at Rutgers. So he texted Goody and was like, hey, I want to start wrestling. 
Like, how do I do it? You know, I see what you have built down there. I see the amount of people it draws in, you know, it's a no brainer in Jersey. I want to do it. So Goody guided him through the process. He's like, this is what you need. Here's who you need to talk to, talk to the NWCA, talk to wrestlers and business network. They got it off the ground. They'd started the search committee and then talk with, texted him again was like, Hey, now we need a head coach. Like, do you know anybody that can do the job? And Goody, I was sitting in the office with him. He just pointed over me. He was on the phone. He was like, yeah, I got a guy for you. I'll send you his number. And that was how I got in front of them. He got me the interview in front of them. And then it was a long back and forth, you know, a couple of weeks, bunch of meetings. But as soon as I got up there, I knew just even with the location it was in North Jersey's got a lot of great wrestling. And I was within state lines. That was all that mattered to me. It's in New Jersey. You can build a good program in New Jersey, no matter where you are. So I want to orient the audience. You said Tuck. You're referring to the athletic director, Sean Tucker, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, now, I, I've met Sean as well. Uh, talk about the kind of passion he has for program building at that school. Because I think it's important for people yeah. that are coming in to decide whether or not they want to come and be a, be a gothic knight. Yeah, setting the stage. Uh, before he took the job at NJCU, like you said, he was at Rutgers. NJCU had, I think, 12 athletics teams, and they had the same budget that they had back in 2004. Never went up once. When Tuck got there, over the last two years since he's been there, we now have 21 athletic teams and a whole ton more support. So they basically told him, like, we need somebody to come in from the outside and build our athletics into a national Division three powerhouse you know, here's whatever it takes, go do it. And his first thing to do was expand sports, add men's and women's wrestling as the flagship. You know, that's, that's what New Jersey cares about. It's football and wrestling. Uh, I'd say in that order, but I'm a little biased, but uh, so yeah, so he jumped in, expanded everything, gave us everything we needed to start a foolproof program, just go nuts with it. And uh, we've been hitting the ground running ever since, ever since he gave me the keys to the kingdom we've been smashing the battle. So. so Harry, on a personal level, uh, what has it been like to uh, go from a already established Big Ten program at Rutgers to being just told, we want wrestling and go? What's it like to start from absolute zero? Uh, you kind of run around like a chicken without a head for the first 10 minutes. I'm like, all right, I need – gear i need guys i need coaches and you're just running around circles you don't know which one to do first so uh it was kind of like like i said when it was going from high school wrestling to college wrestling you think you know what you're getting into and you think you know what you have to do and what it takes to be a head coach and then you're asked to actually do it and you're like oh god like what have i done i have no idea which direction to put my energy into right now because that's the weirdest thing is no one really gives you uh in college you have due dates and in a regular office job it's like hey i need this thing by friday and when you join up to start a new wrestling program, it's just like, all right, we need a fully functioning program by November 1st, 2020. So there's no deadlines on anything. So really sitting down. And luckily I had so many good mentors, Goody, Stutz, Coach Moore, Lockhaven, uh, you know, Vinny, everybody in my life that I could be like, all right, dude, what, what do I do first? And the first thing is the most important thing, as I figured out, was who you surround the program with, the people that you put in those roles are going to be the ones who dictate where it goes besides yourself. So hiring a really great staff was our first priority. That was what I did for the month of August. By Labor Day, I think I had all four guys signed up. Uh, Nick Gravina, just graduated at Rutgers, four-time D1 qualifier. Ryan Budzik, who will join us here shortly, national champ at a TCNJ last year at 149. And uh, Jay Eckloff, fellow short thing guy, fellow Howell guy, brought in somebody in my consigliere that I can trust that I've known since I was five years old. But he eats, sleeps, lives wrestling, so he knows every kid in the state. He was who I would text when I didn't know a kid when I was recruiting for Rutgers. Like, hey, do you know about this guy? He'd be, he would rattle off his last 10 matches, what his favorite color is, what car he drives. He's great like that. He's a walking encyclopedia, so... He's who you need in your corner when you're trying to go from zero guys to 30 guys in a year. So that was the first thing. And luckily it's paid off. It's paid off dividends since then. When you have good help, everything goes a lot smoother. So we were able to attack everything one thing at a time after that, once you get the help involved. I mean, you're about nine months into this project now. What is, what is the, uh, you know, 
from soup to nuts. Where, where is the program? What is the state of the program right now as you look forward to this coming year? Uh, we're, we're in good shape. We had a lot more transfers than I thought we would. I thought our first class, we were going to have a load of, you know, true freshmen just figuring it out together. That hasn't really been the case because there's been so many guys who grew up in Jersey, wrestled in Jersey, left, cross state lines to go somewhere else. Then they got that first uh, tuition check or bill and they want to come home. They're, they miss it. They miss their family. They miss, you know, their favorite Italian restaurant, whatever it is. Everybody wants to come back. So we've got a lot of guys who have been seasoned in Division Three, Division I, uh, a lot of guys who have been college wrestlers before who are jumping back in. So I think we're going to be competitive right away in a way that I didn't expect us to be when I first took over. And it's a good thing. So Let me ask you this. You know, in addition, obviously, we've got the D1s, Rutgers, Princeton, Ryder here in Jersey. We also have pretty well-established D3 wrestling already with Stevens, TCNJ, Centenary, right? How – how are you setting – how would you set apart what you have going on at NJCU that makes it a, a, an attractive opportunity for students when they look at some of those other programs? We set ourselves apart with the value we bring for the cost. I think uh, affordability is our big thing. That's our thing as a university, so that's our thing as a program too. It goes top to bottom. Um, you're getting a Division One experience and a Division One staff for D3 cost in in-state tuition. And that's something that a lot of other people can't offer and they struggle with it. You know, every school has their unique challenges. You know, Stevens, you got to be an A-plus student to get into. TCNJ gets harder every year. I got waitlisted at TCNJ um, back in 08 and I got into some really good schools. Centenary is up in Hackettstown. It's not for everybody. You know, we, and we have our challenges. We're in a city, we're in an urban environment. We're kind of tucked away uh, from the downtown area, but, you know, convincing some shore kids that they can come up to Jersey city and live and work there and have their good program, have their good experiences is tough. So um, that's our setbacks. But I think we outshine that with the product that we're able to put together for our wrestling experience for the money that you're paying. What's your so we're back. Uh, Coach wanted us to have, you know, he wanted to bring us a special guest today. So uh, I'd like to show everybody. Ryan, you're going to have to click on for that. I just gave you an invite. This is uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Budzik, national champion. Uh, 2000, oh my goodness, 2019 national champion, Ryan Budzik. Ryan, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. And Ryan has been brought on to the inaugural NJCU staff. What's it like? Ryan, you were a wrestler shoot nine months ago all of a sudden you're being asked to recruit kids uh into a program that doesn't that hasn't yet had a match what's that been like for you um you know the transition from you know being an athlete to a coach it becomes easier as you know as you mature and become older you know as as a high schooler you know I was a more of a quiet kid I, I kind of you know kept to myself but as I became mature and was around there were a lot of great leaders and great coaches I kind of just there things they taught kind of instilled in me so it's been an uh, easier process you know transitioning because of my experience in the sport and just the other great uh, coaches and leaders I've been around so it's been a pretty easy transition I would say. You know you're you're coming from TCNJ which is a historic D3 wrestling powerhouse it's obviously a very good academic institution what do you think uh, you know having been at TCNJ and now at NJCU in such a quick time frame what do you think is going to set NJCU apart from some of the other programs in state? Um, I mean, well, right now, you've, you just look at our coaching staff. We have great coaching staff, and it's diverse. You know, like you have me, who's a Division three wrestler. I know what it takes to, you know, get to the top level at D3. But then we have Harry and Gravina, who are D Division one wrestlers. So, you know, now we have – it's diverse. It's not just me, the Division three guy we got. Two Division One guys who are very successful at Division One. You know, Harry's got experience coaching Division One guys, which I don't have, obviously. But you know, so we have a diverse coaching staff. And then Eckloff, you know, he's the he, he knows everything. You know, he's, he's the <laughs> brain. So. We can't all laugh when the name Jay Eckloff is said. You know, he's, he's not good. He's gonna get mad at all of us for this. <laughs> we laugh because we make fun of him every day for being love. Amazing. It's loving. He he knows everything about high school wrestling, man. I, <laughs> I'll have to give him that, you know. Budzik, has Harry been a good boss uh, so far? Be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's been, been treating me, treat me well. Good. 
I try to do the same, you know. You know, Harry, yeah, you <laughs> that's right. That was an important one. I was putting that on. That was getting run no matter what the answer was. Um, Harry, I want to give you the floor for a second because we can kind of wrap it up, put a bow on it. Is there anything else you'd like to tell everybody about, you know, about the program and, and about uh, your, your inaugural season coming up? Uh, the one thing I would say that's hurt us the most at this COVID, so I've just been shouting uh, from the rooftops, the biggest jewel we have is our athletic facilities and our campus and not being able to show them to anybody this uh, spring has really hurt. So I would encourage you, please, I'm going to tweet it out with this interview and all that. We sent it out with our newsletters. I'm going to put up virtual tours. I'm going to put up a bunch of pictures of the JMAC. Go check those out and see what we're offering at Jersey City. Uh, we should have some important news coming up about our schedule and our facility. Good things are happening, and I like as many people that can be a part of it to be a part of it. So stay with us. Stay with us online as we post a bunch of stuff right now trying to get the word out about what we have to offer. Right. Uh, Ryan, Coach Budzik, uh, Harry, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for hopping on with us. Uh, Harry, give everybody what social media should be they, they'd be looking for. Give us some hashtags. Uh, hashtag at NJC Wrestling. That's not a hashtag. That's an at. At NJC Wrestling. I'm at NJCU Coach HT. And we're also on Instagram on the same ads. And I usually go with hashtag G Night Nation, Gothic Night Nation. And that's where I post my virtual tour and all that. It'll be everywhere. You'll find it. I'll put it right under this, uh, this blast on Twitter. We were not hard to find. Very good, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for hopping on with me. No problem, man. Thanks for having us.